Have you ever stopped to think about the fans behind a band? What is it about the music that keeps fans coming back for more? Or is there more? My name is Renee Lipsmeyer, and I am the host of this podcast, The Space Between Podcast, the podcast where we talk about the fans of the Dave Matthews Band. Each week, a fellow DMB fan joins the show to discuss their journey with the band. Welcome to The Space Between Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Space Between Podcast, the podcast where we talk about the fans of a band that has been putting music out for over 30 years. If this is your very first time to listen to this podcast, well, thank you so much. Today is going to be a great episode, but we are going to talk about one band, one band that we love very much. We are listening to this. My guess is that you love this band too, of course. I'm talking about the Dave Matthews Band. So each week I bring on a fan of the Dave Matthews Band to tell us their journey with this band. Of course, with a span of over 30 years, fans come uh, with experience, with no experience. There's there's fans of all kind, and that is what I love about this story. So today I'm actually bringing on someone that has been on the show before. I am going to go ahead and let him introduce himself. And then we're going to talk about what he is doing to further his fan experience with the Dane Matthews band. So thank you so much for being on the show. Tell us who you are. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, I'm, I'm Rob Boken, uh, one of the admins and founder of dmbalmanac.com. So we've been around since, in the form it is right now since 2002, but from the very beginning in about 2000. Wow. I mean, you have not checked about this website. It is one of those like life changing experiences. And I'm, I'm totally nerding out right now. Yes. I love uh, historical data about this band. And so if you dig statistics, if you dig knowing like, Hey, have they ever played this song at this video? Or have I ever heard it? Like all of that information where you're going to dig in this website. So before we move on, I mean, you have been on the show once and you kind of guided us through like the creation of the office, but who is working with you? Because of course, that's one of my very first questions is, are you doing this by yourself? And so mm-hmm. if, if someone is listening and they didn't catch that episode, of course, I totally recommend going back. It was the February when it aired, so definitely check that out. But can you briefly tell the listeners like when that started and why you originally started the website? Yeah, it started in 2000 and really because there there wasn't something like it. There were a couple of websites that um, were partial data and they weren't really all that accurate. And you would go around looking for tapes that you didn't have and try and find set lists of the tapes. And you had to go to a bunch of different places. And it just felt like there needed to be a place uh, for everything and yeah. with some of the stuff that I liked. So if I was creating it as a reference for myself. So things like the song times that I think are really unique to us that have been there, you know, that was just what would make me curious as a fan. And really we've just built on it and we've, we've made it a lot fancier and we've added a lot of, of people that have helped out. We've got a pretty big staff for a website that just handles a band, uh, one band, but um, at the same time, it's it's all to sort of create what we want for ourselves as fans and have been uh, happy that you know, we found people who like the same type of statistical data that we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if no one's ever heard of this website before, I think one of the very first questions that would come to mind when you're like, wow, this is got to be such a labor of love for you guys and so i'm sure that i have to pay for access to this information can you tell the listeners like is that true and how does this website fund itself if 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 you are not paying to get in yeah so we're 100 percent fan funded um we we do a lot of the hosting ourselves as well too um, we do have expenses, of course, just like any of the websites for bandwidth and any of our licenses, but we've run on fan donations from the very beginning. I think not having any ads goes back to that. We created a website that we want to use. 
So I think ads would annoy us. So therefore we don't want to have ads. I, right. It's only been very recently that we've kind of started using the term our users because we, we just feel like we're, we're really big fans. And, and if we want to do stuff that we would like to see, then other people would want to see it as well too. We have an area um, are called My Almanac where users can enter the shows that they've been to and get a lot of different stats that are very Almanac-like stats. You know, it's it integrates into the site very well. When you're logged in, you can go to a show page that you've been to and, and it'll give you personal stats for that show. And as far as that's concerned, you know, even if it's just a penny, that is one of those where just anything that anyone sends to us and we'll send you a login to be able to use my almanac and again that that could be any amount that you choose so really we funded the site from the beginning uh from from that that's amazing that's amazing and so guys i'm not going to spend a lot of time redoing the information so if you really want to dig into what the almanac and it's just the creation of that's definitely need to look for my episode that came out back in episode uh in february so what i do want to talk about during this episode is you have had some incredible opportunities before you and of course my podcast is about the fans of the Dave Matthews fans so i just like to reiterate that because you know one might think that with uh, the information that you're putting together and, of course, owning this website and, and just just the job at hand, so you might have connections to the band. And so I want to talk about that briefly. But, you know, even though you might not have uh, major ties to the band, you have had some opportunities to talk on certain uh, radio channels and emails. So tell us about that process and how in the world did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I've never met the band. We're not really, we're not connected no, with the band at all. Of course, every now and then we get an email. Yeah, yeah, every now and then we. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. You get emails every now and then asking asking the band to play certain songs or whatever. It's those have slowed down over the years, but especially in the beginning, we got those of people thinking that we were affiliated, but yeah. I haven't met anyone in the band. I think that they would really find that conversation probably pretty boring. Like, yeah. no, Rob, we don't have set lists from 1991 lying around the house or, you know, I don't remember what we were thinking when we stopped playing number 40 back in 1990. Like, it, it, they would be terribly bored by that, but wow. We've had um, the opportunity to um, have some communication with management. Uh, we were invited back in 2010 for those Charlottesville shows um, by one of their project managers out and met a lot of people from there and have had the opportunity to talk to some people. Um, maybe it's a story for a different day, but I've had the opportunity to have some influence and in some live tracks picks that was, to me, like what fan ever gets to do that? And I kind of figured that that would sort of be the pinnacle, right? Yeah. Especially there was one in particular where we spent a lot of time talking about it and picking it and going through the process from start to finish, not just like random, hey, this show is good or something. That was pretty amazing. And I don't imagine most fans, you know, would be upset if that's the only thing that they ever got to do, you know, and, and I wouldn't either. Uh, but this was this was pretty awesome as well, too. And it kind of came outside of my personality uh we've we've been in touch and not necessarily me but just really via twitter dms with uh with ari who is at the dmb sirius station sirius xm station 30. um if you've listened to that station then you know who ari is of course and occasionally we would reach out for some questions and you know have a little bit of communication there but I was out at, in Las Vegas for the Sphere concerts for Fish out there in April. And he does the Fish Station too. And was at one of the, it was one of the fan events that, that they had there. It was like a fan art festival where people bring in, you know, their custom fish art or, you know, t-shirts or, or that stuff. And he was broadcasting from there. And it was just during a commercial break. And I was like, you know what? We've been trying to... We've just been trying to talk to more people. Yeah. You know, it's been fun talking to people. We've been engaging with folks uh, in the crew at the concerts. And it's just been it's just been really nice to have that communication. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I was just like, you know what? It's it's my turn to step outside of my comfort zone. So during uh, 
during a commercial break. Like I said, outside of my personality, I just walked up and introduced myself and I said, Hey, I'm Rob with the Almanac and just wanted to say, you know, I appreciate our communication. And he was, you know, he obviously has been using our site. He's a big fan of the band and just had about a two or three minute conversation that was really positive and exchanged numbers. And I said, you know, we had Florida coming up uh, the next month. And I was just like, hey, if you're gonna be in Florida, you know, maybe maybe we can get together and talk for a couple of minutes. And we exchanged numbers. And I thought that was probably gonna be the end of it. I was about as awkward as I expected to be. You know, I look back on it and I, I, I kind of cringe about it. No. Uh, so fast, fast forward to Florida and <laughs> fast forward to Florida and at West Palm Beach on Friday night, he was there and in interviewing the band and we were looking to get a, you know, a bit of communication beforehand, whether it was, you know, talking off mic or, you know, talking on mic because he was doing the interviews for Friday and just ended up talking to the band uh, backstage for a really long time. They were all really talkative and talked for multiple segments. If anyone was, was listening to that, they were, they were great interviews. And uh, so I got bumped by the band, which I think is a little bit better because if he talks to Dave for like an hour and then talks to me, like, you know, that, that you don't want to follow Dave, right? No. <laughs> So, you know, I just, I figured I go to a lot of weekend shows. Maybe I would try and, you know, talk again then at some point in time but i just got a random call on on a saturday uh from ari and it's one of those where it's like okay i i have to pick this up no matter what right immediately a phone rings and i'm like well unless this is my family i'm not picking this up right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and but that's a call you have to take right? like yeah. So he uh, he had mentioned that they were doing uh, some ticket giveaways and looking to do something other than just call, take talking to callers and wanted to have a couple of extra hosts. And they had Julia Cunningham in who works with Sirius XM and does a lot of pop culture interviews and stuff like the list of people that she's interviewed is you know re really long. And, and my name is on it now, too. Right. Uh, yeah. but, but yeah, and I was, uh, immediately I was like, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, yes, before you start getting the anxiety of doing something like that. <laughs> so we, and we had a, a, like maybe a 30 minute conversation and I had a bunch of questions about, you know, various, how do we air a show on Sirius? Like I just nerded out for about 20 minutes of that conversation, just kind of firing off all these questions that I wanted to know, like about the live mix and the airing of the archive shows that they were doing during COVID when we aired some shows from 96 and some shows from uh, earlier on, like right before COVID. And it was just like, so I got to nerd out for, for a little while and then he asked what equipment I had. And I said, I had this little Jabber speaker disc that I used for work that I used on our last podcast. So yeah. if anyone is paying, like goes back and listens to that and wonders why I sound so much better, he recommended that I immediately got delivered better equipment than I was using previously. So now I, so now I have this mic set up and uh, I, I think the coolest part about it was that they, they're kind of an official arm of DMB, you know, like they, they are, uh, you know, the part of the media for the band, uh, just, just, just about as official as anything that they do. So, you know, I had to get approved, right? Like he had already run me by the management and, you know, based on some conversations that we had had earlier, you know, they had approved me to do this. And so that was just like, wow, that's, that, that's pretty cool that this, had at least been planned for that long enough to go through the process. Right, right. What compliment? I mean, what an honor, right? To to just get to that level of of people like they said that they actually have some type of tie to the band, and so I mean that's an incredible thing to get to do as a fan, especially as a fan of of your favorite band. I know that you, of course, are you said just just as big of a fish fan. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's, it, it, goes, it goes with the seasons. You know, I went once once I get my last DMB shows in and the summer tour kind of turns, uh, I've got uh concerts in between before the gorge comes up, uh some fish concerts and festivals and stuff. So 
I think that that actually played a pretty big role in it all working because I was able to, you know, he, he's there and he loves DMB and he loves fish, but everyone was there in a fish mode. So yeah. the fact that I'm kind of bilingual, I think helped out and yeah, kind of, <laughs> and yeah. kind of helped our, helped our communication as, as well too. For sure. For sure. So what opportunities have you had in the ZRC's then that you were a part of for the OP show and I know that me and I'm there uh, and I saw your crew and that's something I guess I'd like to talk about just a little bit is of course it does take uh, people and you try to have people at every show. Is there someone always at a show? We have a person always at a show. So we, we've, we have what I think nine people in our crew and we're, we're not all that spread out throughout the country, but we, so we probably have our own folks at probably uh, maybe half to 60% of the shows one of us is at, but we also have a network of just people and friends and tapers and community folks that we've been around for a r really long time. Like our crew talks for every single show. We have a discord group of around 30. Actually, we probably have three, I have three different DMB discord groups wow, that, you know, between that is probably around 50 people. And there's always somebody at one of those. Um, it, it used to be a lot easier because the live set list page, you know, I like what they've done with the new website, but the live set list page used to be a lot easier to use on the warehouse site where you could just put it on auto refresh and then they would up update it. You know, the second that a song hit, we had it updated in the Almanac. That has kind of changed this year. They, it's just a little less, it's updated a little less frequently during the show. Maybe they, I like to think that they, they thought that we had it covered, not knowing that we were actually getting it from them. But, but at that same point in time as we, we still have to have the information just as fast as we did. So we, we have somebody at just about every show. And if we don't, then um, somebody is watching a couch tour or something and at least feeding our chat so that we yes. can get it updated. Yes. So what are the shows that you had a chance to see that she's of our invite for? So this year I did the Las Vegas show and then I did uh, the first three Florida shows, so Tampa and West Palm Beach. And then I just got back from SPAC this last weekend. And I'll be at Camden next weekend, which will uh, probably end my summer, I think, based on my work schedule. Yeah. Wow. So let's talk about SPAC for just a little bit. Of course, SPAC is one of those venues. And if you don't know what all SPAC of course, that is in New York. It's such a beautiful venue. And, and it's honestly one of those venues that amongst the and Sunday Magazine is, is just one of the top ones that people say, you must go here, you must go here. And that's a reason for that. I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, several reasons, actually, now that I've actually seen this town. I mean, Saratoga Springs is such an amazing city. It's so quaint and charming. And, and last year when we were there, of course, the first races were there. So they just kind of brought in an element of just coolness that I didn't even know I was going to experience. I love the city. The venue is beautiful. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it seems like a park. But then, usually, what people are talking about are the storable set lists that are always coming from those stack weekends. So, is there anything that stuck out to you about more weekend and stack? Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like I go to a decent amount of shows. I don't go to the most. I don't have 500, but you know, I'm probably around like in between 35 and 40 since COVID. But that was my first JTR that I've seen in 11 years. Like going back to 2013, that stat doesn't really seem to make sense to me. I didn't even really know it at the time until I went in and looked at my almanac stats because it just seems like such a ridiculous outlier. So that that for me was amazing. That that was one of my highlights. But you know, if I'm if I'm going through and looking at some of the set lists, like getting Spoon and like Warehouse Nancy's and Seek Up. Seek Up was a miss for me. I had to cancel Deer Creek at the last second. And I think at least outside of that being my annual trip and missing out on that show wise, Seek Up was my big miss. So for them to uh, play that for me Friday night, I thought that that was very nice. But anytime that I see typical, uh, that's one that I want every single show. It's it, it's a favorite. But yeah, I mean, they, they, they play, I mean, this probably starts going back to around 2000. You know, the first show that they played there was in 1994, 
which was a horde show. We didn't even actually have the right set list for it until earlier on in this year. There was no tape for it. And we had had a set list uh, from the same date in 1993, but just a partial of it. So it didn't really stick out. And then a fan had posted to a message board their tape of it. So there is actually a recording of it out, even though we had a wrong set list up for, you know, almost 30 years, 29 and a half years. Wow. And I think starting around 2000, when they, they broke out minarets, that was a big deal that they broke out minarets in 2000 and played it at SPAC. Uh, really starting there is when you started to get the killer shows that stuck out. And then, you know, it, it's come to the point where you start listening for rumors and book it before it's announced. You know, it's, it's one of those is, venues. Why do you think uh, SPAC gets those shows that everyone talks about? Do you think there is a reason? Do you think it's just, you know, luck that it's happening? Have you any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the venue is really unique and it's really loud because you, you have the balcony. So you're getting two levels of sound uh, kind of raining down. And I think... You know, from if you think about the band standing on stage and some comments that are made, like Dave makes in some of the other places, he does point out unique venues and liking venues because 75% of them probably look really similar from where he is. Well, this yeah. one looks ridiculously different. And the sound is really good because it's meant to hold in the sound. So even the sound that you're getting from the crowd, it is built for that. And I think that the crowd there, it, it jazzes up the band and it's just kind of become one of those places where you have different expectations. And really you're starting to look like around 2008 as when you're getting really special shows on the regular, like song breakouts, uh, you know, the, the big songs, the big anchors, the, yeah. the fan favorites, they have a tendency to hit there a lot. And it's, catalog songs like you get songs like lover laid down there a lot where even the songs like i don't i don't want to use the term filler but even the catalog songs are the ones that you don't see quite as often or you know maybe hit that crowd a little bit differently right so my only time that i missed i promise the last year is i wasn't for sure when to expect you 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 go into a venue with all of these preconceived notions because everything you've ever heard about that menu is the reason why I'm a day, right? So you're just like, okay, what is about to happen? But what actually happened to me last year, I'll I'll actually I'll just never forget. I mean this venue will always be at the top of my memories when it comes to the Dave Matthews band. And for a reason like what you just said, I'm standing there. I had you know, I don't know when they're gonna sing. And I can start to hear the music play. And the first thing I do is look down at the ground because I want to make sure that I can hear it. I'm not trying, trying to just like pop off my vision. So I'm like, you're going to work better. And I'm like, what is this? It can't be what I think it is. What is happening right now? Is this really happening? And it just kind of keeps progressing. And, and of course, that's when they broke out ABI then. And so, you know, I am standing there losing my shit amongst a group of people who have no clue why, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I don't want to be my memory of SPAC. And so, you know, I hope to get to go back one day because it is stories just like that every year where something is pulled out of the hat and there is such a big surprise and so i love that feeling not that i i haven't gotten that feeling of other menus because i mean it, this band surprises me i've been kind of nice to you. and i think mean, that's the hook though right like that's kind of what keeps me coming back for more i mean there's so many reasons why i keep coming back for more but one of them though definitely is the surprise is that this band continues to throw to their fans and i have to think that it's on purpose, right? And I do think there is a sense of the band and the you know the association of the band more than just the members on the stage, but that really have picked up on uh hey, let uh fans like it when we do this, let's let's fuck with them a little bit, you know? And so I like that exchange of like energies where the band is like throwing it back to us and seeing how we react and so it's always something like that and, and of course before we get recorded we talked about some of those things that happened last year like 
the the introduction of a fate. Uh, you know, of course, that happened in 2023, Deer Creek. They surprised us all with the art of the fake. And then, of course, that's still happening. It's still something that's kind of in the routine. And I like the Vapics because they really do like to fuck with us. But it's they fall in fun ways, right? And so, and, uh, you know, for, I, I like to think of the, the human elements of that. Like, there has to be a part of being a musician, and I know that this is true just based on the documentaries that I've watched all so we other bands, but there has to be a sense of like just repetition, right? Like, yes, we're having a great time, you like who we're on stage with, but I've played this song two thousand times. Like it doesn't remember you even in those for me, right? Like so now, like there's I, I visually see this game that they're playing. And I like to be this because you know, they do want to continue to engage with their crowd. And so, you know, it's another reason why I keep falling in love with this band even more is because they've just time and time again seem to want to continue to up their day, if that makes sense, or change the game. Or, you know, I, I, it's just, it's unbelievable what they've been able to do in uh, the plus 30 years that they've been around. And so, of course, that leads me to talking about the history of this band. I know we briefly talked about that on the podcast when you were on uh, on the episode that it released in February. But, you know, obviously that's something that has taken a lot of your time is to get to know just on a very personal level. The ins and the outs and the ups and the downs and the stuff and all of the things that come with a history of a band. And so are there any moments in the 30, going into 34 years, like, are there any moments that just stick out to you um, when we went back on this history? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, one of my, one of my favorite shows, I, I talk about it all the time. It's and especially one of those shows that you don't go to. I, I think that 1998 is, is, uh, you know, before these crowded streets come out came out they blew up you know they they sunk the titanic soundtrack right or everybody had bought the titanic soundtrack by the time before these crowded streets came out like one of those two things they can both be true but that tour kind of built up to two big shows at the end of the spring tour which were their first two huge stadium shows that they played they played foxborough where the patriots played and giant stadium so june 5th and june 7th 1998 i think that those are the the band made it to the biggest band on the planet moments those two shows and I think what, what's really interesting about those shows to look back and listen to now is, you know, I, I kind of joke around that right now they're kind of the Dave Matthews big band. Like they have a really big in full sound. And back then in 1998, they really didn't. Listening to some of those shows in spring 98 after before these crowded streets was just really thick and layered. And it's got a lot of guests on it. And then they went out and they hit the road. And as it always does, it took a little while for those songs to really uh, come together and I think be super smooth. But they also sounded really airy and spacey in places. And so you're going to, you then take these songs to these 60,000 person stadiums and they, they brought out the guests too. That's when we first had Butch Taylor start guesting and. Bela Fleck was there, and those were the first shows with the lovely ladies from before these crowded streets guesting. They brought their friend from South Africa, Big Voice Jack Leroy, to guest as well, too, on Penny Whistles. And they played set lists that would be weird in a stadium, right? We've got the Dreaming Tree in these set lists. We've got 36, one of Big Voice Jack's own songs, and just an epic version of Pig that is longer than 10 minutes. It's the longest version by several minutes. And I think that those two shows that I look back on, those two are two of my favorites because like that's right when I was getting into the band and you're cheering on the home team and like they were just killing it. And even the first song was broadcast live on VH1. So I look back at those. I think Central Park is is an obvious one. Yes. But I, I really like what, what I've been getting into personally a lot lately are the very old shows. So our pre-remember two things and even starting to do research on 
how the band came together, like what some of those early shows looked like or them playing together. Uh, one, we don't, the best way that we have of filling in details that I've found is like going to newspaper archives, whether they're student newspapers or newspapers.com, which archives, you know, newspapers from all around the world. It's got millions of newspapers on there. And as you know, we, we didn't have the ability to research all this stuff 10 years ago when we were starting or maybe 20 years ago, but so going back in and finding old advertisements for shows, we've probably added between 50 and a hundred new shows that the band have played in the early nineties over the past couple of years through searching newspapers, whether, whether again, like it's, uh, you know, the UVA's newspaper or even all of the Char the Charlottesville newspapers that would advertise all the bands that were playing at all the bars. And I think what's fascinated me a lot recently is that I did a search and found something from like 1989 with Tim Reynolds and Leroy. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a couple years before the band got together and also two years before we know that Tim guested with the band. So I just started searching, you know, I started searching first for Leroy because I don't know, I go back and I listen to all these old shows and I, I listen to Leroy like 80% of the time, you know, th these days. And so I, I wanted to start to get a picture because we, we know when Dave pretty much came to Charlottesville, you know, the story of how Dave put the band together, but these guys have known each other for a really long time sometimes. And I wanted to find the first time that I could find any interaction between the band members. Yeah, yeah. And what I found was a newspaper from 1970 in Charlottesville that's a picture of Leroy and uh, his brother, Carter, and Carter's sister when they're, they are like really, really young, like maybe around nine or 10 years old. Wow. And there's an eclipse out there and it's a picture from Charlottesville. And I'm just thinking, you know, I remember them saying that they grew up in the same neighborhood, but that just absolutely blew my mind. So at that point I was trying to find the first documented time that I could find them playing together. Mm -hmm. And what I found, I found a jazz workshop that they played together in September of 1982, but you know that they played together a lot. That's the first time that anything is actually in the newspaper. And it's funny because I started to put together all of this information. And then uh, one of the interviews that Ari had with Tim before West Palm Beach and Tim was saying, I did a jazz workshop with Carter and Leroy in 1981 and I still have a tape of it. And it's just, it, it's just funny to kind of see how it, how it all came together. So at that point, I'm like, well, I'm going to trace the roots of this band and I'm going to start documenting any concert, any, I mean, I, I guess we'll call them gigs, right? The, yes. They certainly weren't concerts, right? <laughs> yes. so any gig that I can find of any band member and start to put together this history. So that where, where I think it really starts, if you were to put together like a family tree, it really starts with John Earth, in my in my opinion. Like I'm, I'm sure anybody in the band who, who who was around back then, you know, I'm putting this together from newspapers, and it's probably fifty percent true, right? Sure, but sure. but it's, it's what it's what we have until they document it all. It's what we have. It's exactly right. But did so much that you enjoy picking up this history because I'm not letting you see my. Um... <laughs> I guess it was, it's my thing to do when I, I have time on my hands. I sit and I journal about the history of this band. And I've kind of done some things. I haven't gone as deep as uh, seeking out newspaper articles, but anything I can find on the internet, which thankfully in 2024 is a lot. Again, you, you, you don't know that that's 100% true. So we're documenting the best way that we can. And of course, I share with you and I share it online on my socials. So of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, because still uh this you'll see this, but just a journal full and I and I try to start as early as I could and then just, you know, the different uh people that were introduced and then left and they came in, but each person has such an intricate Part of the name in this band, so it was not something that could have been skipped and resulted in the same man that we have now. And so I did that so much to hear other people. I mean, I know that I'm not the only one, like I know that, but like I love 
the fact that you really are spending your personal time digging for this information because again you're not getting paid to do this this is such a big hobby for you and you love it uh and it and you know it, it feeds you if, if no one ever sees it you still want to know these things right i need a place to go look. so you know exactly. yeah exactly exactly so yeah so it it seems like it, it kind of starts, like if you were to go back from the beginning, I would say it kind of starts with John Durth and he had, he was in a band cosmology is the first one that I really see that he was playing with Tim in New York and the band moved into the Charlottesville area in the, in the Richmond area. So you get, that's kind of where, where that story begins. If, then Leroy and Carter, they're playing together in various jazz workshops, but also are playing in a band Conception, which I start to see in 1982 through 1983. Yes, I've heard of that. Sweet. And we've got Tim Reynolds guesting on these as well, too. And Tim is playing with Cosmology and Carter and Leroy are playing with Cosmology. And it's kind of funny because, you know, Tim is really known for playing on the albums in the 90s, but also this fall tour in 1998 that then he stopped playing after. And, you know, there's all these rumors like, why wasn't Tim asked back or anything? And, you know, Tim very recently said in an interview, I, I didn't really want to. And then you also look at this and you're like, these guys have been playing together for 17 years. Like, it was probably a conversation where it's like, hey, do you want to play? Nope. Okay, that's pretty much the end of it, right? But also, you know, it when when we first found out that they were calling each other grux like and they were like oh tim and carter and leroy they've been calling each other grux forever and it kind of actually was forever like they've been playing together for forever like back into the early 80s so i started documenting all of this stuff and documenting all these shows that leroy is playing and carter carter was joined a band secrets that was in richmond that they were playing you look in the newspaper and there are newspaper advertisements for so many bands in so many bars. Like it must've just been amazing to walk up and down the Charlottesville mall on any night of the week and have like six different places that you could go in and see some sort of band playing. And it's all these names that you would know if you were someone that was following the music scene in Charlottesville and, and for secrets, like I planned on publishing this data back in February, but then I'll find that Roy was in a new band and it takes me three weeks to find all the gigs that he was in and secrets played Thursday through Sunday for like in, in a bar for years and years and documenting all of that stuff just, just takes forever. You know, that was one of my friendly questions that I ask very often. What was what was the name that Carter was in before Dave Matthews band? And honestly, I haven't met anyone on the show yet that knew the answer to that. So I love the fact that you have brought secrets. I always joke because no one ever knows them. Go well, that was a perfect name then. Secrets it was a secret from everyone. And, and you know the other cool thing about secrets is that Butch Taylor was in that band too. So you get you know you get a bit of uh, a bit of extra DMB stuff and how far back that Butch goes with the band. You know Butch goes back he goes back at least to the mid '80s, and then you see some of the other guys that have that occasionally guested with DMB or had like a one time guest spot. Steve Wilson is a name that guested with them in 2000, and he was in Secrets with them back in the '80s too. It's just kind of these random names. It was kind of it was amazing to go in and uh, and see how they fit in with the band at the yes. time, yes. and then John John Durth basically seemed like one of those guys who was not happy unless he was doing something with some band. So he was leading the Charlottesville, Charlottesville symphony orchestra, which also, or sorry, let me, Charlottesville swing orchestra, not symphony orchestra that, awesome. that also had Roy in it and Roy playing with the basics and John Durth then was also at tandem school doing some of the stuff with Stefan where Stefan was in 1989 and 1990 before 
he joined the band really, really young. He was playing originals like swing gigs with John Durth as the band leader too. So he's kind of the connective tissue between a lot of this. And that's not, it's not really a secret or anything. Dave talks about it when, when John Durth is guested with them in Charlottesville, but to see how it plays out and it's not well documented anywhere. It's like a couple of books might mention some of the bands that they were in, but to see it as a chronology, I think was was really interesting as well. You know, I think that, uh, you know, and I'm just gonna do this other thing on the Chief Hall, you know, uh, your own strengths and weaknesses, but I mean, maybe you're meant to write a, a, a Dave and Abby Ben history book, you know, like uh, be the historian on the net. I mean, <laughs> it, it sounds like you're well on your way. something to think about. Yeah, it's it's a lot. And I think I think my personality I am really 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 into something for a period of time and sometimes it's a short period of time, sometimes it's a long period of time and then I just I I just don't want to look at it again. But then I'll always come back to it. It's kind of like the way that I do the bands. You know, it's how I split my time. Uh like I listen to DMB and I am in the almanac many 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 hours a week when they're touring and but i like a lot of music a lot yeah. and when dmb takes this much of your time you have to compartmentalize a little bit so you know like i said the second that we're done with camden i probably will listen to 75 percent fish until dmb are back in august you know yeah, because yeah. we'll be we'll be done at that point so what worries me is i really like the idea of a book and i collect data in a way that i think could be turned around into a book like that's the way that i keep it organized for myself but also it seems like the type of thing that i would work really really hard at for like two weeks and then three years later come back and work really really hard at for a year so i don't know maybe well, here's, to, here's just some uh words i and then we'll talk about this anymore but like you have so much time because you really didn't really want to finish that book until the band themselves are done, right? And then you get time on that other side. And so it's it's something that you're, you just basically that kind of start off because you need, and you've already kind of worked on it. And so by the time you know when the end is, you have so much of it done. So it seems like such a doing task and it would be, but you're already well on your way instead of, you know, I can't think of anyone else that, rather read a history book from like as far as from a fan perspective and and that is why too is because you are not associated with the band you are truly this fan story that i continue to go after is like look what the fans of a band are doing i mean you're you're helping to write the history and you're digging up these dinosaur bones of you know newspaper articles in order to make sure that this story is documented and it's so important because it's it's one day we will not be here one day this music uh, and the music will always be here but the band will not be here and so documenting it is so incredibly important so i support however you do it but I love the fact that you're doing it because, you know, that's the same mission I'm on is to make sure that this time is documented. And so, you know, but thank you for all I, of the hard work going that you put into it. You know, I think, I think what's really interesting about it is when you have that, well, how the fuck didn't we know about that? You know, like for instance, uh, Le Le like Leroy and Carter are playing in a band called Blue Indigo. We didn't even know existed. Like this was something that was brand new. But it wasn't just that they were in this band that we didn't know existed. This band actually played while DMB were active. Like they played in like well into 1993 even. So it's like through 92 and 93. And there are a lot of tapes from this era. And there's not one time, not one time, that Dave said, hey, go check out Carter and Roy in Blue Indigo on Sunday night down at Tokyo Rose or something like that, which is, which I think is fascinating in itself too. And you know, you see these little article comments where Dave says like, again, it's in a high school student newspaper from 1992 where he says like, we actually don't practice a lot. We basically practice when we're on stage. I would like to practice a lot more, but guys are in other bands. And you're just like, wow, like you can see that there's like this, 
this little bit of frustration in Dave too, right? That they're not playing every night because Carter and Laura are playing some else. And then you're like, I wonder that's why he's not telling people to go see this because he's just a little <laughs> bit passive aggressive. You know what? I, I would believe that. Too. I mean, it's, it's you, you, you see it a little bit, right? Yeah, a little bit. So, and it's just, it's it really like, like those things are really interesting. Uh, one one of the things that really fascinated me as well too is like New Year's Eve shows are big shows, and we've known about the New Year's Eve shows. They don't play New Year's Eve shows anymore, and but it's like okay, we've got the '96 one that was a live track. So that one is famous. We've got the 95 that was done on the radio. So there's the pristine copy. That one's pretty famous too. The 94, 93, and 92, they're less famous, but they are still pretty famous. They're out there for you to go get. But 91, like we 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 didn't know until recently that they had played a midnight gig in 91 at this bar Zippers. Somebody sent us an email about that. But what they also did on 1991, again, it really plays to how big of a musical town that Charlottesville was. What they would have an annual first night in Virginia in Charlottesville where all of the downtown would have these little one hour concerts in all of these places. And I'm not talking about Miller's or the Jeff. It's like first Methodist church. And you can look at the schedule of it, and we actually have it up on the website, where you can look at this, you can go into 1991 and find where they played this first Methodist church, and they played three gigs. They played three 45-minute gigs at this Methodist church, basically took all the equipment down, some other band would play, then they would set up again, play another 45 minutes, take it all down, play a third 45 minutes, then run across downtown and play at Zippers, a midnight show. That's amazing. And we didn't know any of that three years ago. And we didn't know about these Methodist church or first night in Virginia until maybe seven months ago. And kind of a little uh, call back to what we were talking about earlier. That's the conversation that I would want to have with Dave. He'd be so bored about that. Like, tell me about that time in 1991 where you had to tear down at the Methodist church three times and then go play across. Like, I think that thing is that is just really fascinating that a band that is this big right now is doing that back then. And to hear about in the newspaper about how popular they are and how successful that they are going to be in 1992, like their second year on the scene and two years before under the table comes out, like that, it's it's really been a lot of fun to read. Like that's kind of the book for me is I want to read a book of these newspaper clippings, you know? Yes, true, true, because there's clearly so many things going on now. And, and you never and know, they know about this band, but it's, you know, and knowing that uh, Puff is today and you and things he would talk to him about. I wonder how many times he's thought back to those very moments. They may actually be very, you know, kind of pretty, like, I'm sure. I haven't thought about that in, like, you know, however many years. Like, it may be one of those type moments more than, like, you know, but my, I understand what you're saying is I'm always saying, you know, if I, if I make it to me day or any one of the band, I just want to, like, chill around a campfire and, like, smoke some weed and not talk about Dave Matthews band. I just feel like we want to talk about whatever else he wanted to talk about. Like, camping, kids, life, like, whatever, right? So, I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> Be a way better conversation for him than I would be. I'm sure I, he'd be done. He'd be done with me after about forty-five minutes. I think. Ooh, man, man, man. It is, uh, you know. Well, we'll see if that ever happens, and then we'll worry about it when it happens. Okay, and it'll be kind of like one of those things when you're talking to Ari and you like create to do something before you think about it. It'll be one of those moments. You know, we'll just do it, and it'll be great. <laughs> you know, the hardest part about doing that is the like I prepped. And I was, I was nervous, but like work wise, I, you know, I, I run big calls. So to me, it was kind of just another problem to solve. Like I went into consultant mode where I kind of release my anxiety by prep. Mm -hmm. So like I prepped all of these notes and he had asked for some talking points. So like I had like 30 different things to talk about the new live tracks that was released earlier that are announced earlier that week and a bunch of different shows like i think we had just done the florida shows so to talk about that i had a bunch of notes or whatever so i was ready and i was really concentrating and i had a bunch of like stay positive like every show's amazing you know like or like whatever just things to kind of put me in the right mood what i was not ready for and i think was a big lesson was 
Rob, what's your favorite tailgate food? I was so thrown off by that question. I was not ready for it. I had nothing. And I'm live, right? So it's not like, oh, I'll get back to you. So I was just like, I, I don't know. I like to get in early. You know, I like to get my spot. I don't really have a favorite tailgate food, which insulted a lot of my friends who prep very wonderful tailgate food. But I'm just like, guys, I was really concentrating. Like I just wasn't. So at that point in time, it's like, okay, concentrate less. Right. Like, you know, be, be ready for anything, talk, like be, just be ready to talk as a human, because yeah. I, I think that that was where I was really thrown off. Like I can talk about DMB for weeks. Right. My leadership. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people know that. And for those of you that are listening or are watching this on YouTube, you now know that like Rob knows his shit and his team knows his shit and all of that uh, energy that they put into this major project is available to all of us as fans. And so what an amazing resource that is uh, for all of us who there are, there is no way that we could do what you guys have done in putting this together. Uh, you know, I would have a thousand sticky notes with information. That's how I put information together. So we need people like Kel to be like, really and put it into a way that we get all have access to it. So it's amazing. Be sure to check that out if you haven't already. It was just simply uh, dmvalmanite.com. Is that right? Yep. That's right. I mean, you can't forget that. It's so easy to definitely check in, pop, you know, pop in, check it out. And like he said, you know, it, it takes a penny or more uh, to have access to the internet password so you can start packing more information, which is a lot of fun to be able to pull it out and say, hey, this is this. I have heard that because that happens a lot. You know, when you listen to this band and you listen to their live shows a lot, you're like, you might have, I don't think I've never heard that. But then to be able to log in and go, Oh my God, I totally have heard that. And this is when, and it's just, you know, a lot of information. So thank you for helping uh, keep us organized in our fan journey with the day not be stand. So normally I would um, do some Dave not be stand trivia. I do that with every guest, but as we've been talking, I was like, you know what? This is like doing trivia with a trivia book. And so I don't know. I have anything that you don't know, but if, uh, do you want to how about try? next? How about how about next time I ask you trivia questions oh, and no. we see how you do? No, see that's the thing that people no? maybe like misunderstand is like I'm good at reading trivia, <laughs> asking you got if it, you have the answers. But like when put on the spot, I cannot think. Oh, and I. I would win my name, like, it, it, that is very, that is very yeah, difficult but, for me. But, but what's your favorite tailgate food? I mean, could you answer that question? Because Listen, if you can, it's one better than those me. Questions, those questions are right on my alley. Like, I know my favorite thing. It's like, and speaking of tailgating, <laughs> like, uh, you know, we'll talk about uh, Chevron's Beach tailgating. How about a tailgating cream that I was surprised about only because Jones Beach is literally like what it sounds like is on the beach on the water you see the stage and there is water and boats behind you it's the coolest place but like that was the last place i was kind of expecting a really awesome tailgate and i had so much food people were so generous but like, people were just like please come get food and it wasn't like little debbie's that and it was like hey we made um the mean shit, like fancy shit. I was like, like hell do you here in New York, right? <laughs> like I would have I would have taken the little Debbie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it lasts close to everything. And you know, maybe you should visit the best thing you should uh eat in hot weather, but I just like totally made up something. But it was fancy throughout the fruit style class uh with John Stage. And so yes, I'm always ready to name my favorite television food because I I am in it woman and love the subway. <laughs> It's not too gifted, it's not too hot, but yeah. Uh, you know, I love to have uh, some trivia. We come back on the show, we'll, we'll prep a little bit more for that trivia. And then also we talked in general about trivia just because that was something that you and several of your friends did uh, in the past or so. So in closing, tell us uh, how it was that you started your own little part of the Dave Matthews Band trivia. Yeah, I guess it was during COVID and what, what we did, it, we, our, our crew, our crew has been tight. Like most of the people who have been doing this, right. It's the reason why we do this. 
we started the core, the core of our, well, I don't want to say the core of our crew. The beginning of our crew started probably back in 1999, I would think. And, you know, it's, it's stuck. Like we're, we're, we're all still together from that, but you know, as everybody's gotten older and they've gotten their families, people started going to fewer shows, but it, it, it wasn't just that it's that we stopped talking quite, quite a bit. Yeah. You know, you may connect on Facebook, but it was funny. Like we, somebody posted to our group, uh, a screenshot of the pre deer Creek message that went out in like 2018. And it's like this random Facebook post with a couple of people tagged of who's going to Creek this year. And so people just kind of showed up and the friends that were there, like, it was great. You got to hang out and see each other. But I think when COVID happened, we all got into a discord and we added person by person to it. And we just needed something to do. And we were listening to music together. We were streaming music, I think on Twitch and listening to it as a group while chatting in discord. And we were listening to a DMB album every week. And when we ran out of albums to listen to, uh, I started to put together live mixes. So we would have a theme. Our first one was like unreleased songs. The second one was like best of Bella Fleck in like the later years and just came up with a theme every week. But as part of that, uh, we got together and did online trivia through Kahoot. I had done like recently or like earlier in the week, someone from work did a presentation like a trivia or something. So we just started out and did 25 questions one Saturday night. And, you know, at the beginning of COVID, like that was enough to get you through a week. And so we started doing every Saturday night trivia and live music mixes and did it for well over a year. So starting, I think, in March of 2020, and it was going on really through May of 2021. And then even getting together occasionally, it will do trivia night every now and then. But every single week, we would do 25 questions, five categories, five questions in each category. And we started rotating who would host it. And there'd be a lot of pressure to come up with good trivia questions and good categories. But that's really how we got through COVID was that Saturday night that we were all looking forward to. And uh, that group is still together now. And that's that's kind of the crew that helps us put together all of the information that we get for each of the concerts and continue to do trivia. We probably do it three or four times a year now still. Dude, I love that so much. That's, that's literally the origin story on where I came up with my trivia liner. And, uh, you know, it's during COVID and we're all looking for these to do. And, and I'm a trivia and turkey in town. I love it. And so, you know, in order to get together with my dignity and friends and family, it, it took uh, it took it something. It took was something to do, and so uh, Triggy is what we landed on, and that really was what kind of launched this podcast. Was putting those people together and talking about getting Matthews band, but specifically the fan experience. Because you know, when we were going through COVID, yes, we had the music, and thankfully, Dave, uh, you know, was doing his live shows in his home, and so we had some things. But we really kind of leaned on each other to get what we needed uh, that we didn't have anymore and and a lot of the Dave Matthews band experience as a band is getting to know the community of other fans and so we really kind of just rallied together and did you know some of the same things we we hovered down and we got with COVID uh, with the Dave Matthews band trivia and so that was something that I definitely wanted to bring into this podcast because that's kind of what catapulted me into this and so it's been so much fun it's been fun to you know I always tell people when it comes to trivia trivia is an opportunity to learn something you know it shouldn't be intimidating it should be exciting because you just learned something new about this band that you love so much. So, you know, I say all that to say, you know, just put it out in the universe that, you know, the next time you and your group uh, want to do a show thing, I'd love to just like have ear to stand and just listen to everything you all are saying because I'm totally being everything out on the other side and like frantically taking notes. <laughs> it, it's pretty ridiculous. We've got, we've got some ridiculous people and just the, first of all, when you do, when that's what 25 questions a week over 60 weeks like by the end we've got some pretty ridiculously obscure trivia questions or you know interesting categories that involve whistling uh, you know it's just it, it, it was a whole lot but at the same point in time you know we all like we all love the band and i, and I think the it 
I don't want to say that we were doing less, but we were doing less. Like we weren't all talking. We were going to fewer shows because we, you know, it wasn't like friends that we didn't know friends that were going to be there. And what it did is it really reignited the passion, right? Like the love is always there, but the passion is whether you're searching newspaper articles or whether you're trying to find old shows or going back and, you know, listening to every say goodbye from 1997 that, that, that you can, that's the passion. And I think doing that during COVID actually, like, I think that I went to 30 concerts in the 11 years before COVID and I was at 30 in the three years after COVID. I mean, it, it really, it really like fired us up, all of us. So it just kind of fed on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'll say this time and time again, the more you really dig into the history of this band, the more like you are, if you fall in love with this band. And so, you know, that's why I continue to say, uh, if you just found this band, you have got, you still come in at an amazing time because there's so much to learn about this band. And so if you are into the history, definitely check out the website. And yet, of course, it's just uh, www because, you know, what what else do we say? I am this on all the time at sa.com because it sound like you're or something I'm like yeah because I am but it's dmdalmanette.com uh and so definitely check it out and you can get all the history of the ignorance and stand that you are and probably some like you said some topics some uh points of interest that you may have never thought about thinking <laughs> on the on the almanac so again thank you Ross, so much for being on the show this week and if you are listening to this and you didn't hear the first interview with him i can't look back in february but in the meantime guys be sure to check out all of the socials of course we have a show that releases every week with a different fan of the day on these band of course the fans of the day that these fans are doing big things in this world and so i just want to make sure that this story is documented for all time so that when people look back at the Nick Matthews Band and their music. Of course, they see that they were surrounded with fans that loved them so much. So until next week, guys, thank you, Rob. But in the meantime, peace, love, and Nick Matthews Band. Thanks, Renee. Look forward to next time. Space.